So this is just my issue set is now becoming considered um, a, a sort of a, a, a somewhat toxic, and I don't like that. Is <laughs> I mean is is a lot of this, and and walk us through uh, because you 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 make the case in your piece that this is it's that very uh, issue is that from a relative perspective, it, it were these guys trying to promote these same ideas 15, 20 years ago, they would have no problems. And in fact, I would argue, uh, you know, maybe, maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, it, they, not only would they have no problems, they wouldn't even gain the, the same measure of prominence because on some level it would have been almost too tame uh, where they come in on this uh, on some level. I mean, just walk us through that a little bit and give us a little bit of that history um, of when, you know, the New Republic was much more amenable to ideas like this. Well, I think that the key example of this, which I think you're pointing towards here, was the notorious uh, special issue of the New Republic, uh, edited by Andrew Sullivan, which effectively took on Charles Murray's uh, most toxic and inflammatory claims as being a central organizing theme, this idea that there was a relationship between race and IQ and that this relationship was genetic, and then used it as the basis for an issue in which uh, Murray's views were presented and then were debated. And this special issue has, I think, acquired a pretty considerable degree of notoriety. And I cannot imagine uh, the New Republic, certainly today, or Slate, which also uh, published some uh, contrarian uh, stuff on this by Will Salatan, who I have to say to his credit has uh, recently written in order to say uh, what a terrible idea that, that, that this was, or any other mainstream publication. I cannot imagine today that you would see a, uh, any of these publications publishing a special issue which took such a toxic and inflammatory set of questions as being a serious topic for debate. And I, I've got to say, there was one other very, very interesting kind of implicit dialogue that's happened over the last couple of weeks, which is uh, that there was uh, that in the wake of Williamson's firing, there was a big meeting that happened in the Atlantic where somebody leaked a transcript of uh, what, uh, what uh, Goldberg, the editor, had discussed and also the uh, prominent voice of Tennessee Coates who talked about his experience and the experience of being an African-American public opinion, uh, public uh, intellectual and uh, opinion writer and so on, and uh, how he had felt during his time uh, at the Atlantic. And, uh, and so Coates said that when he, when he had written for the Atlantic, he had had to go in and in his words, uh, you can see me arguing online with Andrew Sullivan about whether black people are genetically disposed to be dumber than white people. I actually had to take this seriously, understand. I couldn't speak in a certain way to Andrew. I couldn't speak to Andrew on the blog the way I would speak to my wife about what Andrew said on the blog in the morning when it was just us. And then he uh, says that uh, even recognizing who Andrew Sullivan was and what he was, he learned from him about his craft and his voice. And then uh, Sullivan wrote a couple of days ago in response to uh, a recent piece on Coates and also this uh, broader set of questions about intellectuals uh, and what they can or cannot say. And he wrote about how he deplored the fact that we had left a time in which it was possible for him and Tennessee Coates to have a disagreement uh, about the subject of identity uh, politics, but where there was a civility about it, a generosity of spirits that transcended the boundaries of race and background. So, and I'm, I know I'm going on here, but it seems to me that there's an important, uh, interesting difference of uh, perceptions and uh, memories here, where for Sullivan, this is a open, clear debate where we can be civil and we can be generous to each other. And Coates, experiencing exactly the same kind of debate, is saying that this is a debate where he effectively could only participate if he shut up about what he actually thought about what Sullivan was saying. And I think that the change from that world in which somebody like Tennessee Coates had to shut up into a world where he can push back against this is the world that is making a lot of people very, very uncomfortable. And and it and, and we should be clear, it's making it uncomfortable to those people who have who are having to sort of deal with um, 
deal with arguments that they hadn't had to deal with before and having to cede some of the, the, just the territory. Right. I mean, the, like the, the, the idea, I mean, it's, it's almost comedic in a way. The, the idea of, of Andrew Sullivan saying like, I had this, there was a time where we could just share and just uh, intellectualize over whether or not the person I'm talking to is from a, a genetically inferior race. <laughs> and that genetically inferior uh, race uh, person was, was an exception. Uh, but he was perfectly uh, polite about discussing this with me. And now I feel like that's lost. Like the it's it is it's almost funny if it wasn't so sad that um, that that he has those type of blinders on uh, that. I, I, I don't know. And, and I want to just introduce this concept, too, because uh, I, I don't know if it's fair to say this about any of the people in the intellectual dark web. Um, but I certainly have been unfair enough to suggest for the, this as the uh, for a couple of people in that group. Uh, you talk briefly about um, uh, Philip Kitcher's writing in a book called uh, In yep. Science, Truth and Democracy that there is an epistemic, uh, epistemic, uh, excuse me, epistemic, epistemic, yes, yeah. bias in favor oh, yeah, uh, yeah. of sorts yeah. of arguments that these thinkers embrace uh, because they're talking to uh, an audience. And this is sort of, this is uh, sort of like, I guess, getting back to talk radio on some level that, um, uh, that Kitcher felt that there was definitely, um, mm. there was, there was, there was money in them, their hills. Right. I mean, that this yeah. this stuff well, can I be think, monetized. Yeah. Yeah. And and here I think there is, you know, there if you certainly look at talk radio, you know, so you see the vast political economy, which uh, springs up as a result of it and which then uh, gives rise to Fox News, which uh, in which Ailes uh, is, is uh, commissioned to create Fox News because Murdoch has uh, has done, gotten a report written, which more or less says there's room out there for talk radio to be done with video, and we need to get somebody to do it. So there, there is an economy which revolves around this. And also, I think, uh, and in fairness, you know, so the, a lot of the people who are identified in the dark web intellectuals, you know, some of them may not have sort of uh, subscribed to some of these things. Uh, some of them may not even have been consulted all that much before they were so branded. But there is also for, I think, some of them, there's a kind of a contrarian impulse, which springs on the one hand from the delight in seeming to be an, quote, independent and uh, and uh, free thinking person who is fearless about what they say. And on the other hand, in knowing that you are getting a um, pretty big cheerleading uh, faction of people who are finding that their prejudices around a particular community, a particular group are being confirmed by what seem to be sober, neutral and scientific people. And I think if you look at the history of racist speculation about people's intelligence, or if you look at the uh, speculation about women's intelligence or abilities to do their jobs or whatever, you see a pattern where again and again and again, you see different spurious and pseudoscientific reasons being advanced or theories being advanced as to why it is that uh, black people are less intelligent than white people, or why it is that women are incapable of doing this, that, and the other. And the science changes dramatically from uh, theory to theory, but what doesn't change at all is the prejudice. And that suggests to me, and uh, indeed to Kitcher, and I think this is what he's phrase framing in a very polite and philosophical way, that suggests that it's really something around the social, uh, the, you know, the social dynamic which is unleashed by the uh, existence of these broadly shared prejudices that is what is driving the, quote, research, unquote, rather than any kind of neutral and dispassionate spirit of scientific inquiry.